Thousands of children and youth are homeless in Kansas, most of them in a hidden form of homelessness, living with other families called doubling up. Their access to school and educational services is guaranteed by the federal McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Act and Kansas State Department of Education policy. Forced to stay with other people temporarily because they have nowhere to go, doubled up means instability, tension, and worse. Parents may legally throw their teens out of the house and call it emancipation, or they might abuse them, or family split up. Youth struggle with their hardships with nowhere to go. So I was called to the principal's office one day. I can't remember if I was a junior or if I was a senior, and my mom delivered papers to me because she had me emancipated. And so she told me I could come and get my stuff and be ready uh, on the porch that night. Youth on their own for a variety of reasons face extraordinary hardships with few services or shelters to turn to. I left home since I was 15 and I turned, I turned 18 today. Now I live with my with this lady, she used to be my manager. They also have some problems and since I'm living there I get to live those kind of circumstances. Sometimes I feel like like, I don't even belong. So me and the girls and all my belongings are packed up in this little one-bedroom apartment of my boss's. Two weeks after we moved in, he died of a massive heart attack. I had no family, no help. My ex-husband was mad at me, you know, for leaving. And so the landlord said, well, if you can't come up with $450, you need to, to get out. And I'm like, you know, I have two kids. I don't, I tried to get assistance, the welfare, a um, couple churches in the area. Nobody could help me do anything. So me and the girls go, I talk to Angie. I explained to her what had happened. We're getting evicted and explain to her what's going on. She takes pity on me and she says, well, you can move into my house. The problem is my daughter has six kids and they're staying with me. And I was like, okay, I don't care at this point. I just, I didn't care if it was a floor to sleep on, you know, whatever. Nowhere to go. That's the bottom line of homelessness. Few realize that a safety network doesn't exist in many places. The room, that we were gonna be staying in was probably literally from the door to where I am back. And it had a twin bed mattress in like a little makeshift closet. And it was very small. And I knew that both my girls and myself were not gonna be able to actually be in this room. So that's the time I talked to uh, my ex-fiance about taking Madison, who's our daughter. Falling into homelessness is easier than climbing out of it. Being able to access stable, affordable housing presents the ultimate challenge. I was in the Marines for four years. Uh, that's where I met my daughter's dad. I married him, but we separated because he was an alcoholic and abusive. Yeah. We became homeless as our house was falling apart, and our landlord refused to fix it. We lived with like 13 other people in a two bedroom home. I lost um, a big part of my income and I have health problems and I was going to be moving into subsidized housing. I found out that I didn't qualify. I found myself without a place to live for me and my daughter. I moved back to Kansas uh, a year ago after spending some time in domestic shelters. Uh, my daughter and I we lived together uh, for a couple months, and we couldn't seem to see eye to eye on discipline. She did get upset with me one night, and she threw me out of the house. Living in Wisconsin first, and ended up moving to Colorado to get away from the abuse. Didn't work out there in Colorado with family situations, so I ended up here staying with my brother, and. It's a big household. Uh, um, it's got him and his girlfriend and five children, and then it's me and my two children, and they just moved in another family, and, and it's two adults, two more children, and there's like five dogs and a cat. And it's, it's crazy. <laughs> I needed more time with my baby. She's four, and 
in the military, there's not really time with my baby, so that's why I left. I stayed with my mom for a couple of weeks, and then I stayed with a friend, and then I started school, and so the military started paying me a housing allowance um, while I was in school. Um, I moved into my place, and then I kind of fell behind on bills because something happened with my car, and I was trying to pay for my car, but pay for my house, and that ended up in me getting evicted. Then I moved in my car. My car got stolen. So um, then I started staying with different friends, bouncing around from my friends to my cousins, to my dads, to other friends. We had a fire in California in Barstow where my son was burned pretty bad. Um, when he got out of the hospital, we were homeless. We stayed in about 15, 20 different hotels, trying to keep a roof over our head. And then my dad put us on a bus and we came back to Kansas. We stayed with a friend um, for about two months. That didn't work out. I got a call from the bank that said they were repossessing our mobile home. And the next day, and yet again, found myself in a situation where I didn't have a home. And again, thank goodness for Julia, she allowed Josh, my firstborn, Josh and I to stay with her until I got into housing. And I had a disagreement with my parents, and she didn't agree with my parenting style with my daughter. And so, once again, um, I found myself without a place to live. Um, I was asked to leave the shelter after a week and a half. Um, one of the guys says, well, look, and I've already found an apartment. You know, you and Hannah can just stay there until you figure out what to do next. And I was just so grateful at that time because there was nowhere else to go. I mean, every kid has needs, but she has severe, severe eczema. So a lot of times she doesn't get any sleep. So now she's waking people up because she's uncomfortable and she's screaming and she's scratching. So you kind of feel like you're walking on eggshells and you know sooner or later they're going to ask you to leave. We stayed at my friend Trisha's house. It was awful. I had to work at 6 in the morning and she didn't seem to quiet down until about 4 in the morning. Um, so it made it hard for me to get sleep to go to work because I'm sleeping in the living room, which is I'm in her way, you know, at her apartment. So. That did make it very difficult. We literally, at one point in California, I was dropping my kids off at their friend's house and I was sleeping in the car behind a restaurant at night. Well, it came to that they couldn't stay wherever they were staying. So we drove around till about two in the morning until I finally decided to break down and go to the shelter that they had there because the shelter there was very scary and I didn't want to go there. And I ended up, you know, because I wanted them to lay down in a bed somewhere. And it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I had to fill out all this stupid paperwork. They finally got to go lay down in a bed at like 4, and then we were kicked out at 6. I know it's not fun having to live with other people, especially when there's abuse, you know, where you're living and you witness stuff. And it's getting to the point where I can't deal with what's going on there at the house. And... If I feel the shelter home's better environment for me and my kids, then yeah, I mean, I will get, you know, do it, you know, but I try everything to have to go from there, but I'm looking at my safety and my kids' safety is what worries me. We moved in with this man and there was a lot of tension there as far as he wasn't used to having a child around. And so that tension was put on me, and then as I carried that over on my son, and it stressed me out. And it was just over um, basic things like um, how much water he could run in his tub for a bath. I, I wasn't ready for this, another relationship, so I spent a lot of nights sleeping with my son in his bed and it was just an uncomfortable situation and I I didn't know where to turn next. I had no place to go. Most of the time I rented um, storage unit. 
that was another added stressor on us. You know, how are you going to pay for your storage unit to keep all your stuff if you don't have a home when that storage unit, you know, comes up? It's just, you know, everything just piles on you and you're like, it's very, very hard. But when you live with someone else, it's their rules. It's sort of like being on eggshells. So you have to make sure you don't upset that person and you realize this is not your stuff. It makes it tough because it just makes it seem like you have nothing. I lived out of boxes and a storage. So it was just having enough money every month to make sure I paid my storage because the people at the storage told me, if you don't pay your storage, after uh, I think it's two months, you're behind. After that third month, they can sell their stuff if they want, sell your stuff if they want to. I had some things in storage which I couldn't pay the storage and lost my belongings. Right now, basically, all we have is the clothes on our back. You feel like the rain cloud is constantly over your head. Until I got into my own housing, I never felt like I completely belonged. I was always afraid that my son would not have a place. It, you're fearful all the time. It made me feel like a bad human, it made me feel like a bad parent, it made me feel like I didn't deserve my kids because I couldn't take care of them properly. And it puts a lot, a lot of bad feelings on you is people will say that people choose to be homeless or they choose to live that way. And I don't choose to live that way. I don't choose to put my daughter in that situation. I don't choose to be in the situation that I'm in. Um, but I can't change my health situation. Um, I actually have a bachelor's degree in social work and I'm licensed as a social worker. Um, but I let my license Laps, I mean, because I couldn't afford to pay my reinstatement fee. Um, and because of my health, I can't do a job in social work. It's tough. It makes me feel like a loser. I feel like I've let my daughter down. I always would tell her that I felt as a parent, you know, tell her I'm sorry that I felt as a parent and sorry that I got her in this situation. And my biggest fear is her being taken away from me. I don't even know how to describe the feelings that you have when you're homeless and you have children. It's like, where are they gonna sleep? Or what's gonna happen tomorrow? Where are they gonna be tomorrow? Especially if you don't have very good finances. It's horrible. So I've sat and cried. Like, how am I gonna get my children a home? Where's their home gonna be? We lived in one room, two beds, five children, and they fought over who's going to sleep in what bed. They're crammed in one little tiny room, and that causes stress on everybody. I've seen, they, they sit and they just cry. Mama, when are we going to get a new home? I'm like, I'm working on it. My son was having trouble in school, and I could tell this situation wasn't helping him at all. He's probably been in... Oh, I would say 10, 11 different schools. I've been behind a lot of times in school. Every treated me bad, but I've been through a lot of tough times. Yeah, sometimes people can get on my nerves. It's just, I just lose my temper. It just feels like I don't want to be in school no more. It's just, I want to go to a different one or just live in an empty room because of that. Being, being uncertain of not having a place, a roof over your head, really just breaks a person down. It's very hard, very depressing, especially with the kids, you know. Always a lot of fighting and arguing. Not enough food or, there's no privacy at all. People coming in and out of your room don't matter, people stealing from you, you know, it's, it's hard. I really didn't want to put an ad on Craigslist because I know there's a lot of fruitcakes out there. 
But at the same time, you know, I'm like, okay, I don't know what else to do. I put, you know, I'm a woman with a small child trying to get out of a domestic violence situation. But, you know, I put in the ad that um, I would prefer, you know, somebody needs like a living caretaker situation. I want to earn my own keep. I'm not looking for somebody to be my sugar daddy or take care of us. I just needed a safe place to be able to start fresh so my kids and I could have a future. When me and the kids came, we were staying at my friend Rachel's in her husband Shane's house. Me and him got into an argument so bad that me and my kids literally were walking into town and didn't know where we were going because we had nowhere to go. After calling every day for three weeks to um, homeless shelters and no one had an opening, and I told my daughter, I said, well, looks like we're going to be living in our storage. Um, I told her we would just say that I'm working at the storage and that's why the bus had to come and pick her up there. I had nowhere else to go, so I was like, I have a storage, so that's <laughs> that's going to be our home. You know, it's paid for, you know, and we'll have to make it work. I was really scared just because it's cold, but I have like a little propane torch. And so I told her, we'll just burn the, the propane torch. Instability and danger lurk as unscrupulous hosts, family, friends, or acquaintances subject their desperate lodgers to sexual abuse, human trafficking, or prostitution. I made it clear I'm not looking for a relationship. This is not about sex. I, I kind of looked at it like I'm really not going to get probably much of a worse situation than I'm already in. Where I'm at now, the way he replied to the ad, he sounded educated and he said, you know, all the right things, but not in that manipulative kind of way. But when you're in such a bad, fearful situation, it's about anything seems better than, you know, what you're in. And then when you have a child and you see what's happening to that child, you know, you just you kind of sort of make an irrational decision to get away. And that's what I did. I mean, I didn't want to be woken up with him screwing me or raping me or my daughter or anything like that. And so I just said, come get me. And I was grateful for the help. And now that we're here, it's still a different kind of prison. It's not our home, but it's so temporary. I don't know, it's hard. You try, you know, try to make all the right decisions and stuff and you still end up at rock bottom. So that's, that's our story. Teachers should understand that sometimes we need their help, their support, not in class, not on what we're looking at, like math, no, nothing like that. We need, like, emotionally, we need someone to be there to help with. Teachers should ask students about what's going on in their lives to get to know the situation and why are they filling classes and why they're, like, not doing their assignments and homework. Get your education, even if you're married. Get your education so you can provide for yourself in case something happens. Because it is hard to make it out there on a minimum wage job, so. You gotta keep your head up and keep going. You can't stop, you can't give up. But you have to keep going, especially if you have children, and get your children a home any way you can. Never thought to turn to teachers or to the school for help. How to help students without homes? A kind word, reassurance of their school stability, discreet access to hygiene and food, tutoring, school supplies, words of encouragement, connection to counseling or other services, realistically challenging their potential, accommodating their unstable living conditions, and often just an understanding smile will make the world of difference. My goal is just to make everybody happy at school. I know I can make some very mean kids. It can be tough, but if they're having a bad day, I, I try to cheer them up, being that nice kid everybody likes. I want a better place for them. I, children should not have to struggle this hard to get to school and stay in school. The hope, the knowledge that I have and believe and my fellow educators believe 
We know that education is the way, the road out of poverty. I know it, I've lived it, I believe it, I work it every day. I want a better place for them. The majority of homeless students in Kansas are doubled up. Identifying students experiencing hidden homelessness and determining their need is vital. Alert staff may pick up clues of housing instability, clarifying underlying reasons for a student's struggles. Identifying doubled up students removes barriers to academic success, allowing the opportunity to focus on the only stability they know, school routines. <laughs>